Well, today's speaker is Kyle Walters. He's sitting on the front row wishing I would stop talking so he could start. <laughs> He's the pastor of Mission Trails Church in San Diego. He's been uh, in ministry in, uh, for about 15 years, and prior to this pastorate, he was responsible for a missions organization that mobilized college students and sent them around the world. And he walked in today and said one of his best partners on that was Lisa Hoff. Sent you lots of students, and he was looking forward to seeing you today and renewing that relationship. He is also the moderator of the San Diego Baptist Association, uh, he, California born uh, and back home where he belongs, pastoring a church in this state. I will say this, uh, I am more enthusiastic today than I have ever been about a rising generation of young leaders that's going to take us into the next 30 years as a convention. Uh, these are not uh, perilous days, in my opinion, they're good days. And I'm excited that we have young men like Kyle who are striding forward into leadership in our convention and in our churches, and I'm delighted to introduce him to you this morning. So Kyle, come and preach the Word of God to us. Well, Dr. Hoff will well know that I was just a cog in the machine uh, in that missions ministry. And you guys have had some amazing chapel speakers here. This is the week where if you're a student, you say, if he could do it, I could do it. <laughs> Um, but here's what I want to say. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Yeah. Thank you for reading that passage. Um, it is my privilege to pastor a church in San Diego, Mission Trails Church. In 10 days, we will celebrate our 10-year anniversary as a church. And I've, I've had all sorts of weird things going on inside of me, celebration and anxiety and pain thinking about some of the things that have happened and it's it's been a more of a mixture of emotions than I ever anticipated it would be but it's amazing and I've thought a lot about the kind of man God wants me to be over the next 10 years as we think about mission and discipleship so one of the things that I did this summer was to spend some extra time in the Psalms and I was asking God what what do these next 10 years need to look like um, I am becoming aware that my most important area of growth over these next 10 years is not going to be in leadership or strategy or skill. I think it's going to be as a worshiper. And I believe that to be true for you, wherever you find yourself in your station of life right now. And so that's why I want to speak to you today from Psalm 24. And that psalm has blared in my mind and in my heart like an anthem this summer. And I kind of can't get away from it. Um, I am a man who needs to worship. Uh, I was made to worship. God forms me through worship. And I'm a man who needs God's word. And this is what I have to give you today. <laughs> I don't have anything else, but I, I give you this with excitement. God's word in my mouth, an invitation for you to worship him on my heart, in my hands, and when we worship, to be fair, it's more than just singing, right? We know that. That's just a part of it. But when we worship through song, of which the psalms are songs, there's something that happens to us. And it, these honest, deep cries of who we are, we get in touch with some of those desires and gaping wounds in our souls. And in that honest place, we meet God. What we love, we worship. And what we worship forms what we love. And God made your heart with the capacity for a God-sized affection. So you better believe that every human, yourself included, if you are not worshiping him, you are worshiping something. And I know it sounds like I'm just preaching to the choir, but this is for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, does he occupy that place of preeminence yeah. in your heart, in your daily life? Uh, you will not be disappointed by him. I will not be disappointed by him. Let me read Psalm 24 to you. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may send the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. 
Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. Okay, there's Psalm 24, and if you're good with math, you know it comes right after Psalm 23. And if you've been around the church or funerals or Hallmark greeting cards, you surely know Psalm 23. This amazingly tender portrait of intimacy, God as our shepherd, intentionally, lovingly meeting our needs and caring for us. But Psalm 24 is striking contrast (laughs) from intimate shepherd and sheep to enormously transcendent, soaring king who holds all creation in his mighty right hand. But it's actually not all that different from Psalm 23. There's a great deal of intimacy here, too, because there's worship. It's central to everything that's happening in Psalm 24. And central to worship is the idea of glory, which is the dominant idea in this psalm. Glory, my friends, is really what we're after when we worship. It's what we're after in life. It may be a way to describe what the secret to life is. What is real glory? Where does it come from? How do I get in on it? And you may know the Hebrew word for glory, kavod, a word that means weighty, heavy, something of substance as opposed to something that's light, something that's trivial, something that's fleeting or passing. And when you encounter something that's truly glorious, truly weighty, truly substantial, even a hint of it, it moves you. Maybe you've read a book that you realized was just in a a class above other books, and it was a true masterpiece of, of story, of art, of thought, of truth. Maybe you've seen a painting or a movie that just took your breath away, more than just entertainment, but you were tapped into some deep, weighty truth, or maybe you've come around a bend on a mountain trail and seen glory, (laughs) something weighty that reminded you how small you are. Worship is about glory, and when we see glory, it makes you want to talk about it. You just can't keep it in. (laughs) But maybe we see God's glory most in people. If human beings are the crown jewel of God's creation, then we see glory in people's intelligence, in their raw beauty or strength, in their kindness. There is a glory to behold. And we long for glory, for the substance of life. The famous American composer, Leonard Bernstein, he commented on hearing Beethoven's Fifth, Symphony No. 5, and he says this, When I hear it, I feel there is something right in the world, something that follows its own laws consistently, something that checks throughout, something that will never let us down. He's getting a glimpse of something, glory. That's what Psalm 24 is about. Many scholars believe the Psalm's written by King David when he brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. No, the Ark of the Covenant was not invented by Steven Spielberg as a super weapon to melt Nazi faces. The Ark of the Covenant was this extremely important thing for God's covenant people. It's this acacia wood box, size of a trunk or a coffee table, covered in gold, and inside of it were the stone tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on and a jar holding manna used by God to feed the Israelites in their time of desert wilderness wandering, and Aaron's staff used, among other things, to bring the plague that freed God's people from Egypt. And on top of the ark were these two sculpted cherubim called the mercy seat, and the ark was placed within the most holy place within the tabernacle, and then the temple, and it served as the symbol of God's very presence with his people, the great, glorious, transcendent God of the universe, eminently close and at home with his people. And it's that ark that's coming home to Jerusalem that David celebrates in Psalm 24. And he's not just writing about an ornate gold-plated footlocker. He is reveling in the very presence of God coming to be with his people, the God of the universe, the king of glory is here, he's saying to people, wake up. Verses 1 to 2 remind us of something important, that we humans, we're just stewards who enjoy God's goodness in creation. Look at these two verses again. The earth is the Lord, everything in it, the world, all who live in it. He founded it on the seas, he established it on the waters. These verses point to God's creative power, his owning power which says a lot of things, but clearly it says, he's God, we are not. (laughs) Let's just settle that. He is, we aren't. He's the creator, we're not. He is the maker, we are the made. And while this is the central truth of the Bible that seems like a no-brainer, we are in many ways wandering down these little paths that lead us to some small little throne that we think is the real thing, but it's not. If he's the maker... 
and you're the made one, you need him. But if he's not the maker and you think you're the one that makes it, do you really need him? What can he really tell you if he's not really king of all? He might be like a really great professor, the best mentor you've ever had, whose wisdom and insight you're, you're in awe of. You call them when you need for help, but, but can they really say to you, this is how I made you to live, and if you go another way, you're going to break yourself? You and I are listed here um, in verse 1 among those all who live in it. Do you understand that? Do you see God rightly who he is? He's the maker. You're the mate. He owns the copyright and the intellectual property on who you are. And there's something important to see here about God's creative power. The description of God founding the earth on the seas, establishing on the waters, help us to realize that God's power brings stability. For Samuel 28 foundations of the earth of the Lord's upon them he has set the world first chronicles 16 30 tremble before him all the earth the world is firmly established it cannot be moved not only did God make the world but he's holding it together yes there's pain there's brokenness there's sufferings Dr. Orr just mentioned suffering is a result of sin it's a result of the fall that's a result of pride and selfishness but it does not mean God has fallen asleep at the wheel the earth is his and all that is in it, and he's working out a plan of salvation and redemption in and through his people. So if the earth is God's and everything on it and in it is God's and all the people on earth are God's, it means two very important things about every human. First, we are made in his image. Well, duh. <laughs> he made us to reflect him and to know him. But do you, have you done business recently with that truth, that doctrine? what it actually means for the other people that you relate to, that they too are made in God's image. Do we treat them that way? What an incredible truth. This is one of the truths that Christianity brings to the world that gives birth to what we understand as modern human rights and social justice. Right? There is no movement for international human rights apart from the doctrine that humans are made in the image of God. That truth should fill you with dignity and it should change how you see other people and it should lift your heart to soaring heights to know that he thinks that about you. Second truth, every human, we are accountable to him. He made it, he owns it. The creation is not ours, it's his and we steward it. Our lives are not ours, they're his and we must continually surrender to him. This is a process ongoing every day. The, the next section in Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6, they tell us something else, that we are worshipers and we experience something profound, we experience God's grace. In redemption. And the psalm begins really broadly, thinking about all the earth, thinking about its creator, but then it narrows the focus really dramatically to the to woman or man who would enter the presence of the creator. Verse 3, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? There's call and response that's happening here, right? Question and answer. Some worship leaders and pastors are, are masterful at calling congregations to seriously consider theological truths and getting it a Shout your response. I can't pull that off in my context, but some of you can. That's what's happening here, though, in these remaining verses. And it's, it's a question of who, who can stand in God's holy presence. It is no lighthearted hoorah for the zealous. This is intended to be a question that should cause any person to re humbly reflect, who am I? Who is he? My need, my, my need for repentance, need for God's mercy. Can you imagine the greeter in this Sunday morning at the front door of your church asking this question, who may send the mountain of the Lord? <laughs> As you come to the front door, who may stand in his holy place? You probably would fire that greeter after this Sunday, but it's the right question, right? And the right answer should be the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. It's not lift up, not trust in an idol, a square by a false God. That's the right question. That's the right answer. If we rightly understand who the creator is and we respond to his mind-blowing invitation to come into his presence, then we'll know it's only the one with clean hands and a pure heart that can reside with a perfect and holy God. These are the requirements to enter the presence of God. To have clean hands literally means that your hands are free of innocent blood. It's an outward measure of character, of righteousness. This person is free, exempt from guilt and punishment. To have a pure heart, it shifts the the issue of righteousness before God from something external to something internal, the nature of a person in the inside. This is exactly what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount 
in Matthew 5, where he holds up the fact that a right relationship with God is not determined just by obedience to some external law, but it's about integrity of the heart. Something has happened on the inside. And it's out of that internal righteousness that outward acts of righteousness flow. It is always inside out. And it's out of an inner attitude of dependence on God that the external life of obedience comes. 1 Samuel 16, I love this. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Clean hands? Check. Pure heart? Check. Okay, well, I I might not have gotten that far (laughs) in the checklist today. I mean, it kind of depends on the day. It kind of depends on uh, how my kids are doing. I often blame them for my bad behavior, but it's really my fault. Uh, It depends on how I'm doing before the Lord. How I'm trusting God, not myself, but the, but the entrance requirements just get higher. Verse 4, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. The literal rendering of the end of the verse 4 literally says, the one who does not offer their deepest commitment of their whole self to emptiness. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds terrible. <laughs> in every other place in the Psalms where the phrase trusting in or lifting up your soul is used, it's used in the context of worship, of, of trusting God, of lifting up your soul to God, but here it's a warning against giving your whole self to an idol, to worshiping something empty. Verses 1 and 2, they set the stage for us to show that anything we would give ourselves to and trust in and worship other than Creator God, anything else is empty. There's an old saying that's quoted in C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory, that says, he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. I, I I think about the celebrity suicides this summer of Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade, and I don't know their full stories, and and only God knows their hearts, but I think they could be emblematic of of something in our culture, giving yourself to something empty, pursuing something, worshiping something, and finding it to be emptiness. For those with clean hands and a pure heart who do not swear by an idol, there's a stunning result listed in verse 5. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. The person whose inner and outer worlds are integrated in loyalty to God will receive blessing from the Lord. Not only that, vindication. This is a legal term, meaning that whatever the punishment or penalty that was declared on that person, it has been fully met, it has been fully satisfied. Legally declared righteous before God, before the community, The penalty has been paid for. No one can legally hold that crime against them again. But this justice, this righteousness, this vindication is not just from county judge. It's granted by God alone. And after the requirements of verse 4, the result of verse 5 is a challenge to us in verse 6. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. For anyone who reads these verses, who hears these words, who heeds this call to worship. This is an admonition and a challenge to follow in the path we have just read about, to be a part of a generation that's characterized by seeking God. Different generations are characterized by different things, and it's usually always painting with a really broad brush, but different values and character traits. Uh, But it tells you something about the people, about the times, about what was important, about character and values. Think about positive things, like the greatest generation. Right, those who grew up in the Great Depression and who fought in World War II. Some descriptions are a little more lighthearted, some more sarcastic. Uh, the Pepsi generation or the MTV generation. Others are controversial, the free love generation. And some are just downright evil, the Jim Crow generations. Friends, the call here is for you to decide what generation will you be a part of. In every age, there have been those who have given themselves fully to God and his kingdom to his priorities, to his people, to his mission. Listen, listen to this incredible truth from 2 Chronicles 16. You may know this. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a promise. What will you be known for in this generation? What would your closest friends and family say that you live for, that you are characterized by? What will your grandkids say about you after you're gone? What will they see you living for, sacrificing for, rejoicing in, trusting in? You and I have the choice to be a part of the generation that is truly God's people. 
those whose inner and outer worlds are integrated in loyalty and dependence to God, resulting in a life of blessing. That phrase, the God of Jacob, at the end of verse 6, this is a window in the text peering out onto the gospel. Jacob, whose story is told in the second half of the book of Genesis, was an imperfect, broken man who had an encounter with God, the angel of the Lord, and he looked in for blessing, right? He even wrestled him for it. And God gave it to him, not because of Jacob's personal goodness, because of God's grace, because of God's promise. That's the righteousness this king of glory gives. The third section of the psalm, verses 7 and 8 and following, shows us something else important about us, that we are victors who celebrate his glory in conquest. <laughs> verses 7 to 8, they climax with this call and response here, more question and answer. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, your ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Verse 7 is a metaphor, lifting up the heads of the gates and the doors. They didn't literally swing upward. There were no DeLorean back to the future doors coming into Jerusalem. That, that would have been amazing. And for a person to lift up their head means that they have hope, right? right? Lift up your head. For you to lift up someone else's head means that you're giving that person hope. The city gates in these ancient cities like Jerusalem, this is where town business was done. The people who gathered there, they were truly the city leaders, the gatekeepers, the decision makers, the influencers. And to those men and women, lift up your heads, look up, have hope. Why? Because the barley crop is bigger this year? No. Because the Assyrians decided to take a vacation and won't be raping and pillaging us this summer? No. Because God is here, present in your midst. Can you handle it? Who is this king of glory? I think this is one of the most important questions you will ask and answer in your entire life. Who is this king of glory? Who is the one that made everything? Is he real? And if he's real, what does he want from me? Blind, slave-like compliance? No. Intimate family friendship. Father, daughter, delighting. Hero and rescued rejoicing. The call and response here, these verses 7 through 10, was written for that time when the Ark of the Covenant, the visible symbol of God's presence with his people, when it crossed the threshold into Jerusalem. Who's here? What does it mean? It's God, our creator, his presence with us, protecting us, fighting for us. So have hope. Lift up your head. Come to him. Verses 9 to 10, repeat the two verses before, not because anybody forgot, but for climactic effect to drive the point home. People, do you get it? He's here. He's with us. His presence is with us. Open your hearts just like these ancient gates that the king of glory may come in. Now, let me be honest with you. This has always been one of my favorite psalms. One of my favorite worship songs in college was Charlie Hall's song, Give Us Clean Hands, which was written from this psalm. But as much as I've loved it, it has always been confusing to me. Maybe better said, it has always been discouraging to me. I so longed, I remember this, like, this zeal as a young man. I longed to worship God and to be fully his, to be in his presence. But I was so aware that my hands weren't clean. And that my heart wasn't always pure. Right? How is it that we can celebrate the victory of his conquest over sin and death and enjoy the nearness of his awesome presence if we're not sure we can get past the requirements of verses 4 through 6? And it wasn't until I began to see the whole story arc of the Bible and to see and believe that Jesus was the hero of the whole Bible that this psalm began to make sense to me and it became honey in my mouth, not something that was sweet at first with the aftertaste of bitterness and guilt. <laughs> Do you have clean hands? Is your heart pure? Do you never lift up your soul to something empty? Welcome to the club, if you answered <laughs> no to any of those. Romans 3.23, we know it well. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you really understand, though, that Jesus is the glory of God? Jesus is the grandeur. He is the weightiness. He is the heaviness and the power of God expressed, sent, commissioned, enfleshed. Hebrews 1.3 gives us this stunner. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 
Jesus, the King of glory, came into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but he didn't come like they'd hoped as the conquering king on his steed, victorious army in tow. But here's something ironic. It's, it's quite likely that Psalm 24 might have been sung at the temple the very morning that Jesus came into the city one week before the crucifixion when he came through the gates. And don't get me wrong, he was going to be conquering king, just like verse 8 says, but he would conquer through his death and his suffering and his crucifixion by his becoming sin, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, for us, and his resurrection. Instead of accepting and honoring him, the religious leaders in Jerusalem rejected him and sent him to the garbage dump to be crucified. But in his death and resurrection, Jesus won the battle against Satan and sin and death. And when he ascended back into heaven, he was truly glorified, victorious Lord of hosts, King of glory. Zechariah 14.9 says, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. That, my friends, is glory. That is the weightiest thing in the universe. That is, in the words of Dorothy Sayers, the greatest drama ever staged. Do you want glory? You have to come to Jesus. Do you want clean hands and a pure heart? Only Jesus was perfectly righteous in every external behavior, perfectly pure in every interior thought and motive. He lived the life you should have lived. He died the death you should have died in your place. Your hands can't be clean enough. Your heart can't be pure enough on your own. But Jesus makes them so. He is the king of glory, and he wants to share his glory with you, First Peter 4 says. He wants you to live for his glory, to center your life around him, the weightiest, heaviest, most significant thing, not an empty thing, and to draw others into that relationship with the king of glory. I want to read you an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory, where he's trying to wrestle with the idea of just what it means for God to have glory and how we relate to him. He says, in the end, that face, which is the delight or terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us, either with one expression or with the other, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. I read in a periodical the other day that the fundamental thing is how we think about God. By God himself, it is not. How God thinks of us is not only more important, but infinitely more important. Indeed, how we think of him is of no importance, except insofar as it is related to how he thinks of us. It is written that we shall stand before him, shall appear, shall be inspected. The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. To please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father and a son, it seems impossible. A weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. My friends, will you steward your life and the good creation of this king of glory? Will you come in to worship him wherever you find yourself at any moment, any season of your life, lifting up your soul, giving the deepest commitment of your whole self to something that is full and never empty? And will you trust that Jesus, the true glory of God, is the one who can make your hands clean and your heart pure? Will you join the generation of those who run hard after him and join the call and response, inviting others to clear away the idols and the self-delusions and make way for this king of glory in their lives too? I'd like to pray for us. Yes. God, we praise you and we worship you and every time we do our words feel inadequate but we speak what we know what you've revealed to us that you're the king and you made us to know you you are the one full true satisfying thing and so i pray for myself and these friends listening that we would center our lives and affections on you and we would receive from you the marching orders for our life king glorious one, and might we find indescribable joy in the welcome that you give us through Christ that we enter your presence 
and we experience the delight of father to daughter, father to son. It's, it's shattering to imagine. I pray that we'd live like it's real. It's the deepest, truest thing about us. Help us, God, to never shift our gaze from the King of glory, and when we do, to keep coming back. King, you're the glorious one. We praise you. Amen. Amen.